Welcome to Creating Healthy Environments with Language Justice. The County Health Rankings and Roadmaps Program is based at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute and is a collaboration with the Robert Wood Johnson Program. This program is a result of many contributions and of many contributions of many colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation. Hi, my name is Erica Burroughs Girardi, and I'm a senior outreach specialist at CHRNR, and I'm based in Central Florida. Today, I'm joined by other colleagues across the nation who's going to help support me with the webinar, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to them today. I'm going to start with Attica Scott, who is joining us from Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, Attica. Hey, Erica. Um, just want folks to know that I will be answering your questions. So um, please put them in the Q&A box. And when you put them there, then I'll be able to uh, connect them with Erica at the end of um, the webinar. And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Attica. Then we're going to travel to Chicago, Illinois, where Joe Hinton is helping to support us today. Hey, Joe. Hey, Erica, glad to have everyone here in Chicago with me for a moment. Uh, I will be interacting with all of you in the chat today. So if you would like to participate and provide some feedback as you hear something interesting during the webinar, please go to the chat icon on your screen. And I'll ask all of you to make sure it says to all panelists and attendees while you chat so that all of us can see your responses. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thanks a lot, Joe. I appreciate you. And then we're going to end up in home base in Madison, Wisconsin, where James and James Lloyd and Kathy Voss are helping to support us with technology. So thanks, guys. Oh, thanks, okay. Erica. It's, it's so great to be here. And I'll just mention that uh, both Kathy and I can be available also in the chat. You can direct message us there if you're having any technical problems. So great to be here. Thank you. Hey, Kathy. So I want to let you know that I'm really excited about today's content. Um, I've learned something new by preparing for this webinar and I'm especially excited to kick off the 2021 webinar season with two distinguished guests who are planning to share their professional and personal experience with you around language justice. First, I wanna introduce you to Diana Liu who is the Communications and Media Program Manager with Praxis Project. Hi, uh, Diane, how are you? Hi, Erica, thank you. I'm really excited to be here and to chat about this important topic. And I appreciate you sharing your wisdom. Then I wanna uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Edwella, uh, Ed Edwelia. You know what, I practiced her name like 15 times. Adelia, I know you're going to forgive me, but Adelia Contreras, who is um, from Lake County, Colorado, and Lake County happens to be a 2019 RWJ of Culture of Health Prize winning community. So hi, Adelia, thank you. Hi, Erica, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here today. I appreciate you and I appreciate your grace. <laughs> okay. So let's get back to the, uh, the webinar. I'm going to share more um, with you about Edwelia and, um, and Diana, more about their biographies later in the webinar. So again, the content uh, in, in this webinar was a little new for me. It may be for you too. And chances are you may want some time to kind of process what we're going to be learning today. So I'm pleased to share that there will be an exciting opportunity for us to do just that. Um, we are going to hold an interactive discussion group to deepen your learning after today's webinar. And these conversations give you the chance to be face-to-face -face with each other, um, other webinar attendees and to share what you're doing locally as well as ask questions of other participants. And I love to hear what folks are doing locally. So I, I truly do hope you plan to attend the discussion group. We are pleased to offer them in partnership with Healthy Places by Design. And Joanne Lee with Healthy Places by Design will be our lead facilitator. I know that Diana and Edwelia will also be joining us this afternoon. So stay tuned for that and watch for details about how you can connect to the discussion group after the webinar. And Joe will be posting that information for you in the chat later on. 
Some of you may be new to County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. We like to call ourselves a family. And if you're new to our family, if so, welcome. And um, I wanna encourage you to get to know us. So please visit our website where you can learn how we support community change with data, evidence, guidance, and community stories. So check that out. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is committed to improving health outcomes across communities in the United States. And ultimately our goal is for everyone to live longer and healthier. And that's what we strive for in the work that we do. And equally important to us is our commitment to health equity. Equity, de equity demands that everyone, regardless of where they live or the circumstances they were born into, have the opportunity to make healthy choices. Our goal is to equip you, who are the change makers out there, with the resources and the tools that you need to create environments where everyone has the fair and just opportunity to live a long and healthy life. And when you think about that, when you think about how equity is related to creating opportunity and accessibility, we can see that language and communication are directly tied to equity. Communication is actually an essential component of equity. So think about it this way, when we're able to communicate effectively, we can advocate for our needs. If we're going to the doctor, I had a doctor's appointment earlier and I was able to explain my symptoms to my provider in a more clear way because of language. And when we are able to communicate effectively, we can share our concerns with elected officials or others who may have um, share our interests or represent our interests. Um, something that's important to me is serving others. We can better serve our neighbor when we're able to communicate with them effectively. So we see how language plays that important role in creating um, opportunity and accessibility. Like many of you joining today, County Health Rankings and Roadmap serves a multilingual audience and we're taking steps to serve our di diverse audience better. Now, I will be the first to say we have much more work to do. And some of you may have heard this age old adage that says do not allow uh, perfect to be the enemy of good. I think that adage kind of best describes our beginning efforts to serve our audience better. To that end, you can access the county health rankings in Spanish. And I'm gonna ask James to go to our live website where you can see how you can actually do that. And when you push that, that button that says Spanish, you can toggle it and then you are actually seeing the rankings in Spanish. So Spanish is the most commonly spoken language in the United States. And it's also the most commonly spoken language within for our CHRNR users. And that's the reason why we are making sure that we're able to promote the rankings in Sp to Spanish media. And we're actually offering a random pop-up survey in Spanish on our website. If you speak Spanish and are um, randomly chosen to complete the survey, I encourage you to do so in Spanish and actually share your feedback about the translation quality. Because we value um, being able to reach out to communities and making sure that we have our information accessible, we are working to be um, to make sure that you have information in a language that you are proficient in. And if you're not proficient in English, that's okay. So with that, I want to bring Diana back up to the stage. And I wanna let you know a little bit more about Diana. Diana's work at Praxis uplifts Praxis mission, approach and work and the work of their grassroots network. 
fiscally sponsored projects and other partners through communication and, and media. She has deep roots in equity, having coordinated an LGBTQ wellness program at a health center in New York and having worked on immigrant rights initiatives at the New York City Commission on Human Rights before joining Praxis. Diana holds a BA in Arts from Sarah Lawrence College. So um, welcome, Diana. And I am going to start by asking you to tell us a little bit more about the Praxis Project. Sure, thank you, Erica, for the introduction. So in a snapshot, Praxis, we support grassroots organizations so that they can do their work more powerfully, more profoundly, and more sustainably. So we really believe that community-led and community-centered work is a key component in addressing health equity and racial justice, both inside and outside of medical care. We also advocate for authentic partnerships with these organizations across different sectors. Um, so we work a lot with public health and in other sectors. Awesome. And before you and I um, dig into our conversation, I want to just talk to our audience for just a second. I'm going to ask James to launch a poll. And this poll is anonymous, meaning when you respond to the poll, we who are the webinar producers don't know what your response is and no one else will know what your response is. I'd like to like for you to respond to this statement. It's a true or false statement. And Diane is going to actually give us the correct answer in a moment. But please respond. English is the official language of the United States. True or false? And I'm gonna ask James to leave that up for just a moment. Give um, most people a chance to participate. Okay. All right. James, you can go ahead and close that. Thank you. So right now we're seeing 42% um, say that English is the official language, where 58% are saying it's no. So we'll 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 find out. Diana, let's start with the basics. Can you define language justice? Yeah, absolutely. So we don't actually have a single or static definition of language justice, and we use a working definition. And this is because we know that this definition will change. It should, and it should change. It will deepen as our movement grows, um, as we learn how to advance language justice, and as well as how, um, as our communities need shift. But for us, language justice is really about building and sustaining a multilingual space um, so that everyone's voice can be heard. It's also um, recognizing and acknowledging that the power dynamics of having an equal and equitable language access can create um, a lot of gaps and disparities and mm -hmm. to work towards dismantling that so that we can build stronger communities for social and racial justice. Um, and it's rooted in a history of resistance by the communities and peoples whose voices and cultures have been suppressed. And so in that way, it's also an alternative to historical disenfranchisement of our languages and cultures that have been suppressed. So is English the official language of the United States? It's not. So we don't have an official language in the United States. Um, however, it's, it's clear from the responses as well as um, I think all of our experiences that speaking in English, reading English is reinforced through a lot of our institutions like our schools, our media, um, businesses, and obviously a lot of social forces. And I can speak for myself, um, coming from a language background that's not English, um, that I've definitely felt the pressure to assimilate and acculturate in this country by adopting English. I think that's the um, experience that many people have. But we can start to collectively shift this so that nobody's left behind and so that we're embracing people as their whole selves with language justice. Yeah, I mean, I you know, English is the language that I heard when I was born. It's the language that I speak. It's the language I'm proficient in. And so I know that um, when I'm speaking to someone who may not be as easily proficient in English, there can sometimes um, be, I don't know, I can feel like I have the upper hand in other words. So in that case, is language related to power? 
Yes, absolutely. So language is is a call for us to organize and advocate um, to create a, policies that are practically addressing equity and for us to have more meaningful impact across our communities and making sure that people are at the table. So in that way, language justice can help us build power by opening doors to new members, to new leaders in our communities, to new forms of leadership in our organizations or communities that we wouldn't otherwise be able to achieve without it. Um, ultimately, you know, all of us just wanna be able to express ourselves and our ideas in the way that we feel most comfortable and when we prioritize language justice in our work, we can all benefit from the diversity that, that that brings to the table. And I know that there are some principal tenets of language justice. So let's look at those principles next. Yeah, so here are just some of the foundations of language justice that I wanted to pull out. Um, first, it's rooted in social justice and racial justice and in health equity. So if we're really trying to address those things in our work, we can't leave out language justice. The second thing is that language in itself is a powerful tool that you can use to help transform thinking and also empower action. Um, and we can expand our knowledge and our understanding of you know, our communities and what's happening when everyone who should be at the table is at the table and can fully participate and be a part of our conversations. Mm -hmm. And lastly, um, multilingual spaces are open to every voice, which means that there's no dominant language. Um, for me, this is really, about shifting the way that we think about language in our, our relationship with language and normalizing multilingual spaces whenever that's possible. Right, so I can see um, that language, ju language justice is definitely more than just making sure there's an interpreter in the room. It's really about creating opportunities for people to have agency. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the agency and having the seat at that table, that's what we're going for. Right, and if we're committed to engaging people and making sure that we hear their voice, we have to take into account that language, English proficiency may not be the same for everyone. And it's up to us to, to, to really try to level the playing field so we can hear their voice too. Um, there are some new terms that, um, they were new to me. So I was curious if you could share that because like, what are what are these new terms and concepts related to language justice, just so we're all on the same page? So you have interpretation and you have translation and interpretation is basically the oral process of taking a message and rendering from one language to another. And translation is just the written portion of that. So like mm -hmm. print or digital from one language to another. And with interpretation, there's two types. Um, there's consecutive interpretation, and that's when the speaker speaks a few sentences, and then pauses, and then lets the interpreter repeat that in another language. So they're taking turns and speaking consecutively, which means that you know you want to budget twice as much time if you're using mm -hmm. consecutive interpretation. And what I'll also say is that you'll want to make sure that you're getting interpreters that have good memory retention. They're going to have to remember you know three or four sentences at a time, and then do the interpretation. Um, but it doesn't require any special audio equipment. So in that way, it's, it's nice and kind of low tech. Then you have a simultaneous interpretation. This is when you have the interpreter interpreting what the speaker is saying at the same time that they're talking. Um, you, you might have experienced this at a conference when there's like multilingual keynotes or sessions and you have to put on special audio equipment mm -hmm. to, to receive the trans, uh, interpretation. Like so the headset, need, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you do need like special equipment for this and for simultaneous interpretation, you also want to make sure that your interpreters are have advanced listening and talking skills um, at, at the same time. So um, yeah, those are the different types of interpretation and translation. Right. And so like, is there one that's better than the other? I think most people find that simultaneous interpretation is is really great and a lot more engaging. The conversation flows better, um, but it does require that equipment. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I will say that, you know, like with all these, with Zoom, um, with other digital conferencing systems, it's a lot easier to set up simultaneous interpretation and you don't need as much equipment. So there's a huge opportunity as things are virtual right now. And um, with consecutive interpretation, I know it's not as uh, fluid or engaging, but I do find it nice sometimes 
that it highlights that you're really creating this multilingual space. Yeah. And I think that consecutive interpretation can work for smaller groups and smaller events. But you know, for large groups, a large conference, then you're really looking at looking into simultaneous interpretation. Okay, well, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, how interpretation might be different than some of the other things that folks are already doing. So take for instance, I know that our CHR and our family, um, a good many of them work for like state and local health departments. So how does language justice relate to the work that some of these health departments or organizations are already doing around cultural competency, cultural humility, um, or even the, nas the national class standards? Because I do know that there is some movement to, to be culturally competent in that way. Uh, yeah, I think this is a really great question, Erica. Um, and I wanted to share some headlines from 2020 about language access as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. Because I feel like looking at these, it's clear that we have a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah. Um, and I know that all these goals and initiatives from like national class standards, cultural competency, cultural humility, ultimately we're just trying to reduce health disparities and achieve health equity. And I think that they provide a good blueprint and starting point for organizations to begin implementing services that are more linguistically and culturally responsive. But there's obviously still a lot of gaps in our community. And this year has shown these gaps more than ever. And I suspect that they will continue as we're rolling out vaccines and stuff. Right. Um, so going back to language justice, it's an ongoing process. And so when you're thinking about language justice, it doesn't end once you meet a set of standards. Um, it changes and shifts as our communities change and shift and as our needs change and shift as we see you know, in this year. And going back to the principles, um, I mentioned it's about transforming thinking, empowering action. So it's really about equity and bringing more voices to the table and creating spaces for all of those voices. And that includes in our decision-making, in our disaster response planning and a lot of different other aspects in our work so that when we're in a crisis like we are now in this pandemic, we don't have all these communication gaps that result in inequities. And I would say that the foundation of all of this is really building authentic relationships and trust with their communities by engaging in this work and language justice work amongst other um, work that we're doing. And that takes time and consistency and commitment. Um, so it's about taking these standards, these initiatives that a lot of organizations are already engaging in to the next level from like inclusion right. to participation, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And um, one of the things that County Health Rankings and Roadmaps, you know, we say all the time, um, relationship, um, I'm sorry, um, community change begins with relationship building. We say it all the time. So you have to build those relationships and build that trust in order to be able to move forward. Good stuff. Um, I will tell you folks, I know that I, I don't know about you all, but I learned some new terms with, with this webinar and, and the type of work that's happening in, in language justice. And I know that um, there are some things that we can do if we want to start prioritizing language justice. There's some steps that we can take. So why don't you share those, Diane? Yeah, so I think first we, we just need to get on the same page and acknowledge and recognize that having multilingual spaces can enrich and enliven and deepen our conversation, especially when it comes to participatory decision making. Um, and when you're building commitment in your organization, that is also an ongoing process. You'll start somewhere, you might you know fall back at some point, and that's okay as long as you keep right. at it, right? So we have a few steps here um, that might be helpful. The first one is to build understanding and intention among your staff. So making sure that there's a collective understanding of why you're prioritizing language justice. So why you're doing it and its value in your work and then continuing to assess ways to build and maintain that commitment. That's what's gonna help you integrate language justice over the long term. This doesn't happen overnight. Um, it takes a while to kind of build this and there's many, many different steps and uh, a continuum of language justice that you can be on. The second thing is to take stock um, of, you know, assess your and map your needs, your strengths and your opportunities within your organization and think about, you know, who needs to be a part of these conversations, 
What are some of the roadblocks that you might run into when you're doing language justice work? And what are the resources that you have available to do this work? Right. Um, yeah. I appreciate that. What, and then um, I'm going to go ahead and let you go through the next other steps too. Sure. So um, the next one is really documenting. So if you're doing strategic planning or even planning your work plan for the year or your events, when you're looking at your evaluation methods, um, as well as documenting your processes, you want to incorporate language justice in all, into all of those steps. And especially, you know, documenting your processes, making sure that you're documenting how you're doing language justice so that when there's staff turnover or, you know, staff transitions, it doesn't get lost, like and you're still holding that knowledge within your organization. And then the last thing is making sure that you have um, a plan for your communications. Think about what needs to change in terms of your internal communications, if, if anything at all, um, you know, your internal documents, if you want to include any sort of language justice in those documents to explicitly show that your commitment. Also your external communication, your website, your social media, your newsletter, press releases, uh, think about, you know, the audience that you want to reach and to bring in. And if you are making these changes, it also means allotting the time for these processes, especially if it takes and requires translation. Yeah, these are important steps as we begin to think about how to make language justice a priority. And I want to encourage our audience to attend the discussion group after the web webinar where we can kind of dig into some of these steps a bit more. Um, I really like what you said, Diana, about language justice doesn't happen overnight and it's a continuum. Um, I think it's important for all of us to hear that. Um, I, I keep going back to that adage in my head, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You want to start somewhere knowing that um, you can't make a, a, a complete change overnight. So if you are interested in beginning to these steps of how you can um, make language justice a priority, um, Praxis Project is here to help you because they have developed a language justice toolkit. So tell us about that, John, Diana. Sure. So um, I love this toolkit. There's so much in it. And I will preface by saying that we co-author and co-create all of our content with partners who are doing this work on a grassroots level. We're definitely not the experts in language justice. We're still very early on in terms of the continuum as well. But this for this toolkit, we worked with well-known and respected language justice advocates. And it covers everything from, you know, why language justice is important to planning an event and all the nitty gritty details there. So, you know, how do you find a good interpreter? Um, what do you need to do to prepare to have interpretation? Uh, what do you need to do in terms of translation for your outreach collateral? And there's a lot of different tools for helping you build that organizational commitment that we talked about too. You know, the creating buy-in with your organization. How do you do that? Mapping out your needs and your strengths and opportunities. There's tools for that as well. Yeah, Good. so check it out if you're interested. There's a lot of content in there. And our audience knows us, you know that you're getting a resource guide after this webinar that will be mailed directly into your inbox tomorrow. And Attica has been putting that resource guide together. And I can promise you this language justice toolkit link is in it. So you will have access to it um, for sure. Diana, is there anything else that you'd like to add? So at Praxis, we're all about putting things into action and into practice. And we don't claim to be experts. And um, I like what you keep saying about, you know, it's about, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, it's not about showing up perfectly. It's about showing okay. up powerfully. And so wow. my recommendation is to start somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. Don't wait. You can learn from your experiences and that's fine. And you should be, and to keep at it. Yeah, you trying to repeat what, I said, I like what you said. <laughs> it's not about showing up perfectly, it's about showing up powerfully. I love that. So um, thank you and don't go away because I'm sure we have questions that have come up um, from our audience. But before we bring um, Edoelia back to the stage, I want to encourage you to share in our chat what efforts have your organization engaged in to make language more accessible to those you serve? So please share your thoughts in the chat um, and be, be sure to click panelists 
and attendees so we can all see um, your response. But again, I'm curious, like what efforts has your organization engaged in to make language more accessible? And I'm gonna um, circle back to Joe in a little bit just to hear what our audience is saying. So um, now I'd like to ask you to join me in bringing Adelia Contreras back to the stage. Adelia um, is a resident in Lake County again, and she has um, works at both the state level and the local level to um, create stronger health e equity advocacy work. She's particularly interested in growing the field of health equity in her area of the state. So that way um, people are able to participate in terms of policy um, and she helps groups and support them, um, support legislation through testimony, story banking, et cetera. So um, Adwella, you've been in Lake County for 27 years and your professional work and your personal life are kind of meshed together in this beautiful place. So I'm actually want to share a picture with folks. Isn't that beautiful? Those mountains and stuff. And so Adwelia, welcome back and tell us what we're looking at here. Thank you so much, Erica. So yes, this is our community of Lake County. Um, we are at 10,000 feet. Um, the highest incorporated, incorporated city um, in the U.S. And wow. so we're famous for, for these beautiful mountains that you can see here, a diverse population. Um, it's amazing. One of the um, initiatives that we recently had in a few years back is um, trying to get our, our younger ages, our youth, um, which is in, in our school system, 70% um, Hispanic, um, at having them have access to these beautiful trails. Because what we yeah. were seeing is um, our tourists were coming in a lot, and that's great, um, but our tr children weren't really experiencing these. So, Well, that's beautiful. And um, I have to say, I, I know what you, you mean. I live in Florida, and there's so many beautiful things to see here that I have yet to see. <laughs> a lot of times as residents, we take that um, for granted and we shouldn't do that. So, um, Adwelia, one of the things that I learned um, about you as, as I was preparing for this webinar is that you have um, a very personal story that's tied to language justice. And it's one of the reasons why you're a community organizer today. And I wanted you, I, I asked you if we'd be willing to, to share that story because it's so personal, but you said you would. And I, I'd love to hear that back. I would love our audience to hear that backstory because it's part of who you are today. Yes, of course. Um, so my, as far as my personal experience, I started interpreting um, for my parents and a few family members as, as young as the age of like seven or eight. Um, and as I got older, um, I started doing um, for like neighbors or, or friends of, of my parents. Um, so I was pretty used to it by, by the time I was in my early teens. And um, we had my parents uh, separated. And so my mom and I went into the county offices um, because she was needing um, to file for child support at the time. And so we already, right, these places are, are, can be intimidating. At that time, nobody looked like me in these offices, um, nonetheless spoke my language. So we went in and um, there was no one there to interpret um, or help my mom with the paperwork. So they asked if I would do it. Um, and we said, yes, because at this, like I said, I was kind of used to it, um, didn't really think much of it. So I helped out, we, we did everything. Um, and what that did for me personally is already put even a bigger dent in the relationship that was pretty rough between my father and I. Um, and, and he still, he, he has, we still talk about it. He brings it up as the, what he says is, do you remember when you went and helped your mom take money from me? Yeah. And so that was really, that is something that I carry with me and has helped me um, now as a professional um, interpreter or translator, really walk into these spaces and really um, show up with, yeah. with that story in mind. 
Yeah. And, you know, someone um, in our audience just chatted. That's a powerful story. And I have to agree. And um, I, I have to say, um, I have seen where children um, have been placed in that predicament of having to be the interpreter for their parents, sometimes even in doctor's offices. And children shouldn't have to, to bear that burden um, because, you know, um, adult business is adult business. Um, and, and they shouldn't have to, to bear that burden, but it has shaped who you are today. It has shaped, like you said, it's the reason why this work is so important to you. And I thank you for doing the work that you do. And I thank you for sharing that story. You know, Diana was telling us um, about language justice and what it is, but I'm hoping you can give us an example of what does this actually look like when it's done correctly? Yeah, of course. Um, in my experience, what I have seen that has been so powerful when I see it is, is the, um, it, it's almost, it's engaging. It's engaging in, in my work that as a community organizer, um, people are involved. There's no separation. Um, I have seen it when it's not working and there is separation and there, and people have to kind of be forced to, to engage. Um, and in my opinion, when that is not happening, it's almost like the interpreter is, um, is invisible. Um, and because, and more things go into it, right? Like we've created a safe space. It's not just saying, well, we had an interpreter. Why didn't anybody show up? It's the way that you prepare for whatever it is, an event, a meeting, how you invite people to the space, giving the interpreters space to talk about, this is what this will look like. Right, and making sure that the interpreter is not off in the corner somewhere with other people, but they're part of the group. Everyone's part of the, you know, you don't have like, oh, the, we'll put the Spanish speakers over there and the English speakers over here because that's not really engaging. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here you gave us some examples of, um, we see different ways where people are interacting and language, that barrier has been removed in the engagement. And that's what we're, that's what we're hoping to see with language justice. Um, when, when, uh, when doing this, when, when we're doing language justice, when we're implementing, we definitely want to be sure that we're putting forth um, our best effort. So what words of wisdom um, or what advice would you give us so that way we can make sure we're doing this right? Yeah, definitely. So um, I would say, first of all, um, interpretation and translation, it's, it's very important work and it's work. So let's treat it as that. Let's compensate people for their time, for their work, for the skill, because it's a skill. Um, I think I think oftentimes we think, oh, well, this person's bilingual. They can come and interpret this meeting just like the little kid can, can do it. No, actually, we have to make sure that we, um, we, we check in with people and we, with interpreters when hiring and um, go through what the, what logistics will look like. Try to build your own pool of interpreters. Um, we, um, we've, we've done both of that. And, and what I've seen the most in my experience, um, practice. Practice yeah. is going to make you um, better. So I just, I think, yeah, start where you're at um, and go from there. And I think I, I um, Diana said it perfectly. Um, you learn from your, your mistakes. We all do. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, 2020 was the year, right? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us back to <laughs> the pandemic. If there's one thing that we learned um, during 2020 was that inequities are real. Um, and so with that, I want to ask you, um, how relevant or irrelevant has language justice been during the pandemic? Yeah, so I've, I've seen it both um, at a local level and at a, at a state level. Been really interesting at a local level. Um, our our county offices, our our county and our city, um, when we were going through this pandemic, kind of had like it's almost like they had this like oh my gosh, we need to have all these material, materials translated and we need to make sure that we have an interpreter lineup. Who can, who wants to volunteer to do that? And I thought, 
I have I had had all kinds of things running in my mind. One, a couple of them were we've needed this for for a really long time. Not not only now. Um, it's not like it just became a need. And let's um, again compensate people for their time. Right. At right. A, yeah, and at a, at a state level, um, it was interesting. I was um, invited to participate with the governor's um, equity response COVID team. And we did a survey out to, to different community uh, in across Colorado. And what we saw were things like, well, people don't care or people like Spanish speaking community, they don't care. They don't take care of themselves. Well, a lot of this this information wasn't accessible, even if it was translated, or even if we had interpretation, sometimes the words were so high level that yeah. it didn't, if I was reading it, I, did, I still was not understanding what that meant. Yeah, I, I think about words like equity, <laughs> and then the new phrases that we learned um, during the pandemic, like shelter in place, and um, these, you know, equity is a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty heavy word. You have to unpack that even in English. So a direct, direct translation of that would be hard. Um, and then again, those phrases like shelter in place and stuff like that. So it really, you know, the pandemic really did show the need for, um, for more interpretation. Here's a, um, Here's a picture that you shared with us. What are we seeing in this image here? Yeah, so um, during this pandemic, um, the, our public health uh, office local, locally had some funding available and we're trying to figure out, okay, what's the best way to use this funding during the pandemic? And we said, well, we need to build our own pool of interpreters. Um, so we, because it was it's in a small community, uh, what I have seen happen, it's usually like, people like myself and three other people in the community that already have full-time jobs are wearing other hats in the community. So um, we decided to do this. And we also not only worked with a pool of interpreters, um, we also worked with the folks that um, were monolingual English speaking. Mm -hmm. And how do they work with interpreter? You plan for time, you plan, look at budgets and things like that. Um, and we also incorporated, incorporated in their um, not just because again, like I said, it's, it's practice. Practice right. is, is gonna be the thing that really helps um, when doing interpretation. So we said, okay, it's, this can't be a one-time training and here you go, off you go, you should be good to, to do it. Um, so what we incorporated in there is the 12 weeks of practice um, mm -hmm. for people that were interested. And um, so they, they received this great training, paid, we paid them for their time, offered a stipend, the space, lunch, um, try to make it as accessible as, as possible. And now our pool has grown of local interpreters here. Um, we use the community language co-op out of Denver, which is amazing. They explain um, something that I've learned from them is they always say uh, they use language justice so that people are able to speak and participate in the language of their heart. And they, they just oh, say it beautifully. That's beautiful. Um, and they, they were such a great resource to us. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much for um, just sharing your story with us about how language has impacted your life, your career choice. I, you know, I, I thank you and for your words of wisdom. And I know you're going to stick around as well for some questions and answers and joining us for the discussion group. So um, thank you so much, Adelia. Um, you know, I'm curious about how you feel about what you've learned today. And um, I'm gonna ask James to launch one more poll. We're not gonna show the answers to this one because this is really just for us to know um, what you're thinking about. But we'd like to know, we'd like to you to just gauge your own understanding of how language justice is a key component to creating equity, equitable communities. Again, this is, this is anonymous or whatever. We can see the lines moving, see how people are answering, but we don't know who's answering what. So just curious about what you're thinking. Oh no, we actually can't see that. James, don't share it. <laughs> I'll tell you, don't share the, don't share the responses because I really just want to know for us later. But thank you for your candor in doing that. 
And Joe, while folks are actually responding to that poll, um, I'm just curious, what are folks saying about how they're working to make language more accessible to those they serve? Well, Erica, you and Udelia and Diana gave me the challenge of, the, of my 2021 because the <laughs> response to this was quite high. Um, there were lots of great examples of providing translation service and interpretation, but I think also just really an embracing of um, Udelia's personal story, um, the idea of language justice that's thinking about non-native English speakers is also justice for people who are um, who cannot read, who may not communicate, or even questions about communicating through a mask. And so taking a justice approach was really resonating with a lot of people in the in the chat. Um, some great uh, thoughts on that we're, we're asking a lot. So really valuing the interpreter or the, or the person who's on our staff who can both navigate a, a difficult health topic and right. also speak uh, a different language than English. So I think that, um, you know, just lots of really great insights and thoughts and, and some examples and resources being shared. So great stuff in the chat. Thank you, CHR and our family. You guys are always on it. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, you had me think about something I had not thought about, um, which is how even wearing a mask can obstruct your, your language. So you guys are always on it. <laughs> so Eric, thank think, you for uh, participating. I think yeah. the poll's about done, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end that. I appreciate that. And thank you all for um, responding to the poll. Um, I want to share a resource with you, and that is our... Um, our uh, um, equity action learning guides. So um, if you're looking to get started with language justice, the first thing you have to do is have a shared understanding between you and your partners about what equity is. So I want to encourage you to dig into our action learning guides about equity. We also have one that's about engaging residents. And you'll remember that Diana and both Diana and Adwelia talked about the importance of engagement when you're talking about language justice. So grounding is important before you even think about like um, taking those steps within the language justice toolkit, make sure that you and your partners understand what equity is and you have a shared understanding of how you can engage community. So again, you can check those out on our website, but of course, Attica will be including them on your resource guide that you will receive tomorrow. And even though we have all of these great tools and resources on our website, sometimes you just want to talk to a live human being. I get it. So these, we, I want to let you know I'm part of a, a team of coaches that you can connect with anytime throughout the year. If you're looking for a thought partner and there's nothing that we enjoy more than talking to community champions just like you working to transform your communities and we can help you navigate a tool or help connect you with others doing similar work or again just simply ser serve as that thought partner as you plan your next step so consider us as a resource and connect with us using the contact us button on our website so in just a moment, we're going to shift to our Q&A time or question and answer time. So please be sure that your questions have been placed in the Q&A box. And if you would do me one more quick favor, I'm going to ask Joe to actually put in the chat a link to a full survey. I know I asked you to do a poll, but this is actually a full survey that I'm going to ask that you link to and tuck away for later and complete after the webinar. So he's gonna um, put that link into the chat right now. And I want you to know, we do take your feedback seriously. Um, your feedback actually does help shape the content of our webinars going forward. So just, just please um, be sure to do that. And um, I want to tell you that um, our next webinar is something that I take to heart. It's pr pretty dear to me. You've probably noticed that food insecurity in your community is increasing because it's definitely increasing in my community. 
The pandemic has shown a light on food insecurity and County Health Rankings and Roadmaps wants to make sure that you are informed on strategies that you can take to take action. So join us next month as we explore strategies to mitigate this emerging health crisis. We'll be interviewing Feeding America, which is the nation's largest hunger relief network. And we'll be talking to them about their equity goals. And then you're gonna hear from the Idaho Food Bank about their work to feed residents, even as they address other inequities that they see in their residents. So just wanna um, thank Joe for actually um, helping with that webinar. I think this is the first time, Joe, that we have ever interviewed um, someone from the state of Idaho. So I'm looking forward to that. And with that, I am going to pause and turn it over to Attica to lift up a few questions in the remaining time we have, and then we'll head on over to the discussion group. Go ahead, Attica. Oh my goodness. Um, this was an amazing webinar, Erica, and I feel like I learned quite a bit. So thank you for this idea and bringing our amazing guests. So we had lots of questions and they fell into a number of different categories that we'll probably pick up on um, during the discussion group if folks join us over there. One is budgets and funding. And then the other really focused on um, amplifying voices of people. And then the third was around language justice in schools. And then the fourth was around local language justice. So I'll try to get to one question in each of those categories. So for budgets and funding, um, the question that came up the most is, can you share some ideas of how groups with limited budgets can prioritize language justice? And this could be for any of our guests, either of our guests. I can, I can start off. Um, I think you, you have to make it a priority, right? If you're seeing a need, um, that this is something that is a need in your, in your office, the workplace, um, you, you have to, just like you make anything else, the, the front office person, the um, technology that you need for, for work, um, you also have to make this a priority as well. Plan for it, start budgeting for it. It might take time, but make some steps to, to get there is what I would say. Um, and I can add to it a little bit. Um, one thing that you could try is to bring interpreta interpretation in for one event and to use that as a way to build buy-in within your organization and to show the value and impact that's having on your community and going from there. Um, again, like I think what Adelia said is, is on the nose, like you really need to prioritize it. And I think that by developing and creating buy-in within your organization is one way to do that. Um, yeah, so that's what I would add. Thank you. Then I wanna to get to this question that came up uh, in several different ways around language justice in schools. And the question is, are there federal requirements for school districts to provide information for students and families who speak other languages besides English? And what resources or ideas do you have to approach school districts about being more inclusive in their communications when responses are tied to a lack of budget or money to invest in this approach? I can um, try and speak to that uh, a little bit from my, um, another hat that I wear here locally is I, I sit on the school board, um, our local school board, and we also have a coalition, um, Lideres Latinoamericanos, and we are, we also have um, a, a section of language access. And so we have gone to the school and, and said, hey, like the first people uh, in the schools, the first people that parents see are, are secretaries. Like, can we work on making sure that we start hiring bilingual secretaries? And it was really difficult because I think we often get stuck in this, like, well, but if we have, if we add this, what are we taking away? That kind of mindset. And that was really difficult to hear. So instead of, I think like maybe what I can offer on this is changing that mindset and saying, okay, if we add this, how does that benefit all of us? How, everybody's gonna have a benefit. That's what I would say to that. Yeah. 
All right. Um, so the last question um, that I'll lift up and then I'll turn it back over to you, Erica, is around local language justice advocacy. So the question was asked, has there been any attempt to engage the business community and ask them to advocate for language equity? That's a good question. And, and you know what, I would invite folks to think about that and come to the discussion group. If, if Diana, Diana, did you happen to know an example? If not, please bring an example to the discussion group. I'm telling our audience, if you know an example. I don't know an example, but I feel like there's been cases in the work that I've done, like currently in the past where involving business group, especially like local businesses, has been really valuable for the community because they know the community, often they're part of the community, um, they're ultimately invested in the community. So I could see that as a really good strategy, um, but I don't have any examples off the top of my head. All right, well, thank you all so much and um, I'll see y'all in the discussion group. Thanks, Erica. Thank you, Attica. Um, and thank you guys for such great questions. Like I said, our audience, it's the best. You guys come up with so great questions. Thank you. Um, so uh, the discussion group um, is getting ready to start momentarily. And so I do definitely want to invite you uh, to attend. Um, these, again, these, these discussions give us the opportunity to really dig in and engage in a conversation with fellow audience members and you get you're going to be face to face with other folks and get to hear what folks are doing locally and so uh, um, please do plan to go. Um, Joe is going to chat out the link for the discussion group link now um, and when you click on the link you'll complete a very, very short registration like a couple of questions and then you'll receive the link to join the discussion group. So I look forward to seeing you there. Um, one thing I wanna say before we close out the webinar, um, I just want to reiterate that um, you don't have to be perfect in this work. I know that um, addressing any equity issue is hard and you, you change makers out there you do some tough work and we appreciate you at County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. We appreciate the fact that you come to our webina webinars to um, hear um, strategies of how you can do your work better. But I just wanna let you know that we are grateful for the work that you do um, locally because it's not easy work. And I wanna thank our guests, um, Diana Lou and Adelia Contreras for sharing their stories sharing their expertise and their wisdom with us because we all wanna make this world um, better, a better, healthier place uh, for everyone to, to live in. I also wanna thank my colleagues. Um, thank you, Attica, um, Joe Hinton, um, James and, um, and uh, Kathy for uh, helping us with this webinar and for you in our audience, please do stay connected with us. We have a presence on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. And the best way for you to hear about our upcoming webinars or resources or tools is to actually subscribe to our newsletter. So I want to um, encourage you to do just that. So thank you very much. And I will see you in the discussion group in a few minutes and I'll see you next month for our February webinar. Have a good afternoon.